one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Sophie and I'll give a proper introduction in a minute once people are all here. Um, this is the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection uh, workroom. So I'll just wander around here for a minute while people are getting settled. Um, this is where uh, curators and grad students and faculty do some of the work studying the fossils. Like this is a camera setup uh, for taking really nice pictures of fossils, like you see one on the museum website or something. We've got this velvet background, little scale bar, so you can see the size uh, of the fossil. And these are um, various fossils that people are currently looking at and working on. Putting them, entering them into the collections and cataloging them. Uh, so, you know, if the museum receives a fossil, uh, it has to be assigned, the number has to be identified, described, and uh, put with a sort of place and time before it's uh, entered into the collection. These are, um, these are what samples often look like when they perhaps first arrived from the field. These are sample bags, classic sample bag with the yellow tag. Um, assigned a number that only makes sense to the person who collected it. <laughs> but hopefully they've written in their field notebook with a description so they know what it is later. Microscopes, dust cover. So this is just a, a, a light microscope. So you put the specimen there. These are going to be your lights, um, but it'll be connected to a camera so that you can look at it on the screen and actually focus it um, sort of externally to the microscope. We have a quick question, Sophie. Where did those samples you just showed arrive from? Yeah, good question. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and there's no clue on these tags. Two three nine zero nine two five. No idea. <laughs> it's a good question, though. These that are, are kind of currently someone's currently working on, uh, whether they're going into the museum or um, just being um, like sorted out, and maybe not all of them will end up in the museum. But that maybe is happening uh, here. So we actually have a comment from Susan Butts, uh, our collections manager, that they were collected in upstate New York. They're Devonian, and they were collected by an undergraduate student. Oh, did she say why they were collected? She did not. <laughs> Maybe she'll <laughs> chat me in a minute. Uh, looking at silification. Silification. Okay. I... Sorry, y'all, I'm not uh, an invertebrate paleontologist, so. Well, that's exciting. Solicification is when uh, fossils, in this case, probably carbonate fossils, limestone fossils, get replaced by silica. Um, silica is like what sand is made of, glasses. Uh, so in, in this case, dissolved well, components, dissolved silica in the uh, flowing in water can kind of come in and replace the uh, fossils that were originally perhaps brachiopods or other fossils that were uh, made of carbonate initially and now been replaced by silica. And that's um, useful for paleontologists. One, it's, just, it's an interesting process, um, but it's also sometimes useful because if the rest of the rock is carbonate or limestone, then you can dissolve the rock in acid, but the solidified fossils will remain. So it's actually pretty cool. You drop this rock in acid, uh, and over time, it'll dissolve away. And what you're left with are these beautifully uh, etched out um, fossils of brachiopods or what have you. And then we have another question about samples. How frequently are you getting new samples? Oh, that's another question that Susan Butts might have to answer. Um, so I don't work in the, as a curator in the museum. I'm a grad student who, you know, I, I studied the fossils, 
that, but I don't catalog them. So I'm not sure how often you're getting them. I, know, I do know that the uh, Peabody Museum collection has 13 million fossils and the invertebrate paleontology collection is four and a half million. Uh, so pretty often, I'd guess. Oh, this is an interesting question for you, Sophie. Um, what is the oldest fossil that you've worked with? The oldest fossil I've worked with? Um, me personally, uh, it's probably a Cambrian fossil. Um, so I work on, uh, perhaps actually now is a good time for an introduction <laughs> and we can get started. Uh, and I'll answer that in one moment. So my name is Sophie Westica. I'm a sixth year PhD candidate uh, in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department here. Um, my advisor is Pintelli Hall, and we work on microfossils, which is fossil plankton. Uh, we're not gonna see a lot of microfossils today. Uh, we're gonna see invertebrates. Invertebrates are any organisms that lack a backbone. Um, and we're mostly gonna be looking at uh, marine invertebrates today. So things that lived in the ocean. Uh, and, um, it's been a while since I was in these collections, so you might have to bear with me <laughs> as I find my way around them again. Uh, but in terms of oldest fossil that I've worked on, in addition to work on, working on fossil plankton, I sometimes work on trace fossils, um, which are, you know, you have uh, sometimes the body gets left behind of an animal, like um, in this case, we have these, these uh, snail shells, gastropod shells, where the, the shell is, is preserved. But sometimes you get the trace that an animal uh, leaves as it's walking or slithering or, you know, gooping along. Um, and those, those trace fossils um, uh, uh, is something we are interesting to study because we, they tell us something about the behavior of the animal. Uh, and they're also, in, in the case of shells, you know, we don't know that the snail was here at this moment in time next to these other snails. It could have been that all of these snail shells after death were washed into a muddy spot. But with a trace fossil, you know that that animal was moving through the mud or whatever it's doing in that in that moment. Um, so it actually preserves an action. So an example of trace fossil is the dinosaur footprint. Mm -hmm. But in the case of our invertebrates, um, they might look like worm burrows or uh, little you know insect footprints, things like that. So the oldest fossil I've worked on is a trace fossil from the Cambrian called Scolithos. And we can actually see some of those in the collections. Um, so should we head in? Yeah, so these are the, in the invertebrate collections. There are other rooms, but this houses a good chunk of the invertebrate collections, just the invertebrate fossils that Peabody uh, has. Um, and since we've talked about trace fossils, I wouldn't do this to you otherwise, but since, since you asked, I, I get to get to them. Some trace fossils in here, so labeled. Um, we even have some scolithos fossils. Yeah, here we are. Now these might not look like the most exciting fossils you've seen, but here, do you see these dots? Each of those is a vertical burrow going down into the sediment, into the mud. Um, and we don't necessarily know what makes the trace fossil. So you, you can tell they're fossils and you can see the, the action, in this case, like a burrow, but whether that was made by a burrowing clam or a burrowing snail or a burrowing worm might not always be clear. Um, and these trace fossils are interesting because, uh, precisely because they're found in these very old rocks um, before a lot of other trace fossils are found. So you, you Nowadays, if you go down to like go out to the Long Island Sound and look at the mud, it's all churned up and mixed and there's like a ton of burrows in it. Uh, back in the day, 550 million years ago, 541 million years ago or so, uh, there weren't very many, um, there wasn't much burrowing. So any burrow is kind of exciting at the, at the beginning. Um, also actually, while we're in this cabinet, <laughs> it's another, uh, another fun fossil, the, uh, the coprolite. Coprolites are fossil poop, 
And this drawer is undetermined coprolites. So fossil poop that we don't know where it came from, like who, who, who pooped it, who made it. Uh, so those are always fun. You believe that there are people who study fossil poop and we don't make fun of them at all. Uh, we can go to some prettier fossils perhaps over here. Sophie, what's, what's the scientific name for fossilized poop? Coprolite, C-O-P-R-O-L-I-T-E. Yeah, coprolite. Um, and yeah, there's all, all, all kinds. So these maybe are a bit prettier. This is the, the Ginsberg collection and it's a lot of really beautiful beautifully preserved fossils. Um, so just for example, here are some uh, crab, here's some arthropods. Arthropods, arthropod is the phylum that includes like crabs, but also trilobites, spiders, uh, insects. Uh, and you can see a couple of things. One, this is incredible preservation. It's three-dimensional, it hasn't been flattened. Most fossils get flattened uh, when they're under the pressure of all that rock. Um, and it's sort of distinguishable from the, the rock around it, which means someone's been able to uh, sort of separate it from the rock very painstakingly. This is a huge amount of work to, to, to get a fossil like this out. Um, we also have in here, let's see, some trilobites. Now, these are a bit bigger than you might find if you go trilobite hunting in New York, say. There's a lot of trilobites in, in uh, New York State, but you probably won't just walk across them they're this big. You can see those are a bit more flattened. Um, what else do we have in here? Beautiful crinoids. Now crinoids are um, sea lilies, it's the, it's the kind of colloquial term. And they have these long stalk and then, a, and then a, this feathery bit at the end. Um, and they would kind of wave their feathery arms um, that's around the mouth, which is in here. Uh, and they're filter feeders, so they're kind of waving their arms and, and uh, little bits of detritus get stuck in their, in their feathery arms and kind of get pushed towards their uh, mouth, which is at the base here. Um, and they were really big uh, in the Paleozoic. And there are still some extant, some living crinoid taxa today, but they're much less common. And they tend to not have this stalk that would kind of they'd, um, be stuck in the ground at the end. So these, these actually, they look like plants, but they're, uh, they're in fact animals. Now this is a beautiful example where we can see the whole body of the crinoid and imagine what it was doing. Um, you don't tend to see them looking that pretty. Instead, you might see something That's beautiful too. Something like this might be more common where you're seeing um, just the impressions left of the little discs that make up the stalk. So that, that stalk would disarticulate or break up um, during, usually during once it, the animal had died. And each of those tiny little discs um, or ossicles they call them, uh, can get preserved, but you don't typically get the whole structure um, I get it in that very pretty example. Uh, so if you're in, if you're in, like I'm from Western New York and in Western New York, you'll see tons of these in the rocks, these little tiny um, disarticulated primary ossicles. So look for tiny little round discs or tiny stars. Uh, so crinoids are, echinoderms. They're related to sea urchins. Uh, and sand dollars and starfish, and all of them have pentaradial symmetry, like they have a, a five point symmetry. So you get lots of these like star shapes, like you think a sand dollar has that star pattern. Crinids have that as well. What else do we have here? Trilobites, always favorite. So less flattened ones. And you can just see the, the real range 
of, of body types. Like you've got ones with these long eye stalks, uh, ones with like more of a, a sort of fringe on the end and no eye stalks. <laughs> I don't know what this guy was doing. This is, you know, kind of crazy, like horns almost. I, I, I'm not sure what you call it. More, more classic styling, but the, these, um, yeah, long points coming off in the long tail. Um, curly, curly Q pieces. Yeah, so trilobites were really common in the early Paleozoic, which is um, shortly after animal life evolved. They're also arthropods, like crabs, like spiders, um, but they, yeah, really common in the early Paleozoic, and then they went extinct 250 million years ago, kind of dwindled to extinction. And then we're wiped out in a, the largest mass extinction from a transit. We can actually go over here. This isn't so much a collection item, but this time scale is useful for kind of placing where we are uh, in time. So we're here right now. And this is the beginning of uh, animal life shortly before the, the Cambrian. And you can see here are our trilobites. I love the Cambrian. Um, and then this is the Paleozoic, and this is what we're mostly going to see today. Uh, so again, if you go to like upstate New York, you're looking at a lot of fossils from this time period. Um, and then we have the Mesozoic. This is the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and uh, where we are in time in, in New Haven is right around the Triassic Jurassic boundary. So actually, East Rock and West Rock. Uh, are both sills, both volcanic eruptions that happened exactly at that Triassic Jurassic boundary. And um, we'll also see some fossils from the Cretaceous, which was a time when there was a really big inland sea over a large part of Western North America. So that provides a lot of fossils as well. Uh, and the, the end of the Cretaceous is when the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, so let's see. Here we have, actually, start over here. Um, in that, in that Cretaceous, well, actually, th throughout most of that time scale that we just went through, you see a lot of ammonites, which are these coiled squid-like animals. Um, so here's, a, here's an example. It looks kind of kind of almost snail shaped, but it's not related uh, very closely to snails. It's actually more closely related to like octopuses and squids. And you have to imagine the the squid squishy squid bit coming out here. Um, these things moved around in the water column, and they actually have a tube uh, that runs through the whole shell. And each of these chambers is kind of a, a separate chamber. And the animal itself only lived in the last chamber, um, but that tube could carry gas or water. And so it allowed it to, to, to like change how, um, how much gas was filling the, the body so that it could move up and down in the water column, like be more or less buoyant. Um, yeah, so that's ammonites. And uh, there's actually a ton here. There's a beautiful, really beautiful specimen. So here you can see the different kinds of preservation. So the, this uh, chamber here has been, or section here has been filled with mud, with fine mud. Um, whereas these spaces here are basically geodes, right? Minerals have grown into them. Um, and then we have some of the probably original uh, ammonite material here in this, this kind of opaque white bit. So fossil preservation is its own field of study. You can study what animals were like, like those trilobites, you know, that they have eye stalks, they have horns, whatever. Uh, you can study their ecology, maybe through the trace fossils or just the fact that we have all these trilobites in one place or something like that. Um, and you can also study the, the preservation, which tells you things about what you're uh, missing as well as what you have. Most things don't get preserved. Most organisms don't get preserved. Um, and so you're, whenever we're looking at the fossil record, we have to be aware of what we're 
getting and what we're not getting. So we're not gonna get the soft, squishy, squid-like bit of the ammonite. We're gonna get the shell if we're lucky. Um, and one uh, interestingly preserved thing on some of these ammonites is this, uh, this like nacreous um, color here, this, the, if you see the like rainbow, rainbow uh, opalescent part, um, that's preserved in some of these because they were in concretions. So they were like surrounded by uh, mud and it ended up preserving that uh, inside part of the shell really effectively. Whereas um, if you don't have a concretion for you know, some of these, well, these are all beautifully preserved, but you might end up with just the more gray, muddy, uh, something like this, something less exciting. Sophie, is that like nacre on a pearl? Yeah, just like, yeah. So it's kind of special that it's preserved. So here's a whole bunch of them all together in a concretion. And no, they weren't alive like this. They've, they died in sink and then were buried like this. They're in nacre. Ammonites are um, also cool because if you see the inside of their uh, of their shell, let's see if we can find a good one. They have, oh, here. So they, uh, the chambers, rather than just being sort of straightforwardly a uh, nice clean line, they're sutured together in these really complex patterns often. Um, and so if you see these, these kind of uh, toothy patterns, um, these are the, the sutures of the chamber and you only see them when the outside of the shell is removed. So you can't see them here because you've still got some of the outer shell preserved. But on the inside of the shell, you see these, these, the places where the chamber wall is meeting the inside of the outer shell. Uh, and those sutures can help distinguish uh, different kind, different types of ammonites, different species. What else? Yeah. Uh, Here's a really good example of those suture marks. So here we've got some of the nacre of the, the, the pearlescent bit preserved, um, but where it's gone through, where it's sort of come off, you can see the, um, the sutures exposed. And no one knows why they had these very complex sutures. That's been a question people have been working on for a long time and haven't really found the answer to whether it was for structural strength. Um, it's not, not really clear. This is an interesting uh, fossil. This is, <laughs> these are tiny oysters. So oysters have to, um, they require a hard surface to grow on, which is why they're often growing on each other. And so here we have a ton of oysters kind of growing on each other, but if we flip it over, it was actually a clamshell that they were growing on, a huge clamshell for that matter. So we can get a sense, um, with oysters, we have oysters in the modern, we know what they like and don't like, uh, but with, with older fossils that we don't still have, um, this is the kind of thing that can tell you uh, what they preferred, you know, what did they eat, what did they live on, what did they like. Um, and actually, over here, we have Eurypterids, which is New York State's state fossil. These are sea scorpions. Uh, they're not actually scorpions. They are arthropods um, and they, uh, they are extinct. They're no longer, no longer with us. These could get actually really big. Um, so the largest one is something like eight plus feet long, if you imagine an eight and a half foot long, one of these guys coming after you in the water. Um, they could live, they lived in an uh, ocean setting, but they also sometimes were in fresh water or brackish water. And they, uh, they had a big range of um, 
of body types. And actually uh, some Yale researchers, Ross Anderson and others studied their eyes using the Eurypter fossils in the Peabody um, were able to look into their look at their eyes to get a sense of how they saw, like how much vision they actually had. And from that infer whether they were uh, predators who would jump out at their prey or wait in ambush or predators who kind of stalk their prey. Um, some were scavengers, some were predators, some were more, more, uh, more chill. And this here is one, so in, in those Europe traits, you maybe saw the different pieces of the back. And this is one segment from a Europe trade back, which gives you a sense of just how big these things could get. And over here we have more Europe traits, uh, and also a collection of trilobites altogether. So here is a, this is a great example of a fossil that um, gets scientists thinking about questions of ecology. Did these trilobites die together or did they live together? Were they all washed into one place by a storm after their, they, with these dead bodies? Um, or were they, was this like a, a mating ritual of sorts between trilobites, hard to tell. And um, that's something that, that uh, yeah, the paleontolo paleontologists might use a fossil like this and come to a place like the Peabody to look at a whole variety of trilobite fossils and, and get at that question. For instance, um, trilobites uh, molted like other arthropods. So are these dead trilobites or are they just the, the molts? Um, and you might look into that by looking at a bunch of other trilobite fossils like these ones and then all the ones in their cabinets over there to get a sense of uh, how typical it was to see all these trilobites together like that, um, or how typical it was to preserve the, the back and the front or the eye stalks or something like that. Uh, trilobites were basically like roly-poly bugs that lived underwater a long time ago. So they, they actually would roll up to protect their soft underside, just like roly-polies. And here you can see one. Well, this one actually looks like it's been rolled the wrong way. So maybe that's just a, something rolled in death. Um, but you can imagine them curling up. Uh, here we have type collections as well. These are um, whenever a new species is described, scientists have to put the, have a specimen in a museum that people can refer to. So if I say, okay, I've, here's a new species of uh, you know sea urchin that I'm describing then you could say, well, like, I think that's not a new species. I think it's the same as the other one. And, and I can't tell from the photographs you took. So I need to be able to look at it, right? And, and you have to be able to say, okay, it's in a museum. You can go look at it. Anyone who wants to can see it. And that's part of keeping science reproducible and, um, and, and sort of uh, transparent. So the one uh, benefit of, of having a museum here is that you have these um, uh, type collections, these collections of, of species that are like the descri described species where you're like, this is the one I described and that's just identifying this new species um, that people can come to look at. Um, how are we doing on time? As you're looking around, Sophie, um, what's the weirdest thing that you've come across um, while working in the collections? Weirdest thing, ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, oof. I'm not sure. I think honestly, the, the trilobites where you're like, I, I just don't understand what they were doing with their eyes up there or <laughs> why they needed long tails. I think the trilobites might be the weirdest. Uh, but maybe that's just because I don't work on trilobites and they look weird to me. <laughs> um, I, I do work on fossil plankton, like I said, and we do have, we don't have very many fossil plankton that you can readily see because they're very small, but here are uh, graptolites, which are one kind of uh, plankton. So these are, these were, um, and these don't look like 
perhaps very much. But you see those dark lines against the lighter gray uh, background. And you can see that they have, they kind of have a sawtooth pattern. So these are actually colonial animals uh, like corals are or rhizomes. Um, and so each of those little kind of pouches would hold a little tiny uh, animal and that, uh, that together would form this, this colony, this line. Um, and these were plankton, so they're living on the surface of the ocean and then they'd die and sink down to the bottom and they tend to get preserved only uh, in these dark shales, which are places of the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean where there's not a lot of oxygen. So there's not a lot of other stuff eating them uh, or microbes that are gonna decompose them. And graptolites are really useful for figuring out how old other rocks are. Um, so biostratigraphy is the field of taking fossils, like identifying that, okay, this fossil looks from this time to this time. So when we see it in a rock, we know what age the rock is. It's actually really hard to tell what age a rock is. Um, so using fossils is one of the main ways that we can do that. We also have some sea urchin fossils here and sand dollars. So you can take something that looks very recognizable if you've been to a beach in the Northeast or the West Coast. Um, and then you can look at a fossil from uh, much longer ago. This is from some 40, 50 million years ago. Uh, and, and it's been replaced by rock. This is very heavy. Uh, and compare it to the modern ones. Get a sense of what this, uh, what this animal was doing, what kind of life it led. Get these really round ones as well. They're pretty weird. Um, some fossil sand dollars. Again, much heavier than the um, modern because they've been replaced by rock. And we also have right here some of the oldest annual fossils. So here we have fossils from the Burgess Shale. Um, these are these are actually very it's very special that we have them. One of the uh, curators of the Evinburbert paleontology, Derek Briggs, um, did his dissertation on Burgess Shale fossils and sort of made his made his made a name for himself. Um, these type of fossils. They, again, may not look like much, but you're looking at some of the oldest uh, animal fossils that we know of. And Burgess Shale is an a incredible locality because it has this exceptional preservation. Uh, say it preserves things that wouldn't or ordinarily get preserved. Um, so including soft bodied organisms. So again, the squishy stuff doesn't tend to get preserved. When you think of dinosaur fossils and dinosaur bones, but less like dinosaur skin, dinosaur muscle. There might be some of that preserved, but it's very, very hard to find any. So when you get uh, something where all the soft stuff is preserved, you have a window into what the whole uh, ecosystem looked like, not just the hard body things. And you can see worms and you can see squids and, uh, you get a much better sense of what the world was like. And since these fossils are so old, uh, this is a, a window into that early animal life. So we have a few questions, Sophie. Um, so you mentioned the New York state fossil. Does Connecticut have a state fossil? <laughs> I believe it does, but I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't think. I. Um, yeah, I don't think I know what it is. Oh, we have a couple, of, New York. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of participants raise their hand. Let me see. Yeah. Um, let's see. Megan, do you know what the Connecticut State Fossil is? Hello. Hi, Zach. Do you know what the Connecticut State Fossil is? Oh, glad you asked. It's Dilophosaurus. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Really? Zach. Yeah. What does a Dilophosaurus look like? Oh, can you hear me? 
Okay, Dilophosaurus means two crested lizard, which means it has two rounded crests on its head. Whoa. It's a cool Very dinosaur. Cool. I've seen it in many films and documentaries. That's really cool. Thanks for yeah. sharing. You're welcome. We just have a few more questions if you have time. Uh, why did you get into this field of study and what do you like about it, Sophie? Yeah, um, I got into this field of study in college. I had a, a teacher who, uh, Sarah Proust, who taught an amazing invertebrate paleontology class. Uh, and and then let me do research with her, which is really cool. Actually on solidified fossils. So those fossils we were looking at from New York State earlier when we were talking about solidification. That was, um, the solidification is what I studied first. Uh, and I got into microfossils specifically because um, Basically, plankton are always dying and raining down to the seafloor. So if you were to walk around on the bottom of the middle of the ocean, you'd be crunching along on dead plankton. Um, and so you have trillions of these. If you go down and take a core of that, you've just got trillions and trillions of fossils, which allows you to kind of do statistical studies in a way that's harder when you only have you know, one dinosaur bone or uh, even you know, a handful of trilobites. And microfossils are, um, used to tell us about what the environment was like in the past, like what the climate was like. So anytime someone says the climate was, you know, like this 10 million years ago or 50 million years ago, there, uh, a lot of that information comes from microfossils, comes from these uh, fossil plankton. So I like being able to uh, use fossils to tell something about what the world was like a long time ago. And then the particular fossils that I study right now are uh, diatoms and radiolarians, which are fossil plankton, well, plankton, they're, they're still alive today, that make their tiny little skeletons out of glass. Uh, so they take silica from the water and construct these little chandelier-like uh, skeletons, and they're beautiful, and they're really tiny, I mean, less than a millimeter across. And um, yeah, and they're just raining down at the bottom of the sea floor. That's so cool. Um, another question, are any of the fossils in the invertebrate paleontology collection from the Permian period? Yeah, uh, and I don't know that I could give you any in particular, I'd have to go look for one, but certainly there's some from the Permian period. Um, the Permian is an interesting time for, uh, it had a lot of, uh, a lot of silica, the, the, the last we are talking about, um, but it also was a, a Quite, it had a period of quite cold time. And then it was followed by the Permatriassic extinction, which was the largest uh, extinction in Earth's history, mass extinction, or at least since animal life began, um, bigger even than the mass extinction that killed the dinosaurs. So the, the Permian was pretty interesting and we definitely have some, some fossils in there. I think uh, brachiopods, this is more Susan Butts' territory than mine, but I think we have some brachiopods from the Permian. And we have a few more questions, if you have time. Um, back to, you were showing some of the burrowing animals. Why wasn't there much burrowing 541 million years ago? Yeah, so, so that's really the start of, of animal life. So the, when, when we, we have life in the fossil record before then, we have little uh, single-celled organisms um, and algaes. And, and so we see, we see evidence of life before then, but multicellular animal life. So macroscopic fossils, things that you can see without a microscope, that doesn't really get going until around that time. Um, first with some bizarre fossils called the Ediacaran, uh, which are these uh, uh, sort of soft bodied, we actually have some sort of mold. So these are, these are, <laughs> They, these were weird soft bodied uh, animals that were preserved in the rock. And these are rubber like uh, impressions of those uh, fossils. These are not the fossils themselves, um, but they're basically, you know, he took, took plastic or rubber and like put it into the, the impression and, and took a, a cast of it. Um, so you, you get these really bizarre soft bodied things 
and a sort of exceptional preservation window. It seems like a, a time period where for some reason these soft bite things are being preserved. And it's a bit of a, a bit, of, it's ongoing research whether that was a, 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 a sort of, there's something about the environmental conditions at the time that preserved those soft bodied organisms or um, whether it's just that they were kind of common and nothing else was there and there weren't a lot of burrowers. Uh, and the burrowing really just didn't get kind of invented as a lifestyle, <laughs> I guess. Um, so you see the, the evolution of behavior in the same way you see the evolution of eyes or wings or feet and, um, and having being multicellular and, uh, and a little bit bigger and then starting to burrow uh, was sort of a, a revolution. Um, so it's actually, a, a, there's a lot of you know, food in the, in the seafloor we think about all the things that are dying, they they kind of are buried on the seafloor, right? They drop down the seafloor. And there are animals like, you know, trilobites and things that are maybe crawling around eating that that carbon, but there might miss some and then stuff is getting buried. And so you, you get some that continues to go down. And so the first organism that was like, hey, <laughs> we can go down into the mud and there's more carbon there. And that's a whole lifestyle, it opens up this whole new, new niche, this new world. and uh, burrowing begins but then it, it kind of slowly it takes a while to, to really take off um, so even though you have these burrows like the, the vertical burrows uh, very early on it's not until much later that the, the mud gets thoroughly mixed you start seeing uh, thoroughly mixed mud for most of the oceans so most of the sea floor today the, the shallow marine settings today are very thoroughly mixed and you'd be hard pressed to find a place where there aren't any burrows it would only be in rare places with very low oxygen and things. Um, so yeah, so it's partly the, the kind of innovation side, figuring out like, oh, we can burrow. And then you have the, the ecological build as well. That's so cool. Thank you so much, Sophie. I think we are just about out of time. If we didn't get to answer your question, we'll try and email them, email you answers if we can. Uh, it might take a little while, so give us some time. And don't forget to join us next week. We'll be touring our vertebrate paleontology collection. So we'll go from creatures without backbones to creatures with backbones. So dinosaurs and lots of cool stuff. So hopefully you'll join us at 12 o'clock on Wednesday, July 14th. And thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you. Thanks all for listening.